Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Great. Okay. Very good. All right. Is it time? It's time. Let's see if we got, uh, see what we got here for attendees. Twenty-one. Okay, it looks like I'm probably gonna have to let everybody in again. So let's do that real quick. Gallery. And admit all. There we go. How's that? One in the waiting room. She is currently joining. Excellent. 21 folks, that's great. Okay. I am recording, so that's good. This is all good stuff. Okay. Let me go to my screen sharing so I can show you my little keynote. Okie doke. And I know now that I'm going to put you guys on my right side so I can see my, <laughs> my list of stuff. And then, of course, I want to have the course open. So let's do that. Just actually, let's go to the modules. That's good. Okay. Did everybody have a good day off yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I didn't do anything. <laughs> That's a good day, if you ask me. I mean, just Netflix and eating my Panda Express and uh, somewhat cleaning my room. You know I what? I'm really happy to hear you say you hung out on Netflix because you know what? If, uh, if you guys want to write, especially for TV, uh, and you don't know what's out there and you're not paying attention to what's being produced, what's being written, and, and what's, you know, appearing on television... Uh, you're going to be behind the eight ball and you'll, you'll never get ahead. So the fact that you took the, your free time and did that is, is excellent. And uh, particularly if that's your, you know, if that's your um, career objective, if that's your goal is to, to start writing for television, uh, then you have to consume as much of it as possible. Um, I have, I mean, all my writer friends out in California uh, are, you know, exhaustive consumers of television because they are, I mean, that's their stock and trade, right? Just like I, you know, I look at as much as I can as a, you know, as a cinematographer. Um, and, and now, you know, I listen as a writer um, because that's my, you know, those are my craft focuses. You know, I have to know what's being done out there um, and not necessarily to emulate but if you want to see the contemporary um, wisdom as far as stories, you know, story structure, character evolution, um, exposition, um, if you want to see what the contemporary tolerances are for um, violence or um, uh, uh, vulgarity, expletives, um, sex, uh, you need to look at the current TV shows. Don't watch anything from 10 years ago because they'll reflect different social values. Uh, so that's excellent. That is, that's really good. And, you know, tele, you know, uh, Netflix particularly, cause it has good programming. Um, I don't know. I'm encouraged by a couple of the previews for the networks uh, for this coming season uh, in terms of programming that they've got slated, but um I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic about network television, but Netflix in particular, excellent. And then feature films, obviously. Uh, uh, Natalia, did you have a question? Yeah. Hi. More than a question, I had a comment. Um, so I really like uh, Netflix and all the things that um, Spain has done, like on Netflix, like all the series yeah. in Spain. And I've also seen like feature films, um, produced by Netflix and 
all of them come from Spain. And it's so interesting that I already recognize like a little bit of, of the Spanish um, narrative. So I found that a lot of their uh, of the Spanish productions have like this um, trend to play like with the times and like go backwards and then uh -huh. come to the, to the actual times. And also they love suspense and like not knowing like who the killer was or like trying to figure out how to cover up uh, the real murder. Yeah, like the murder. And it's just like interesting to start like understanding and already seeing why, what might happen just because the patterns repeat like on different productions. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I've, I've seen exactly what you're describing in some of the content that was produced in Germany as well. Um, and it's interesting how you can, you can see some of the cultural, um, uh, some of their legends and some of their superstitions coming through in the, in the content, in the, in the story themes, like for instance, the Germans, I mean, they're in, you know, uh, arguably Eastern Europe, right? And, and in that section of the world, there's a lot of um, arboreal forest, right? And so the forests there are ancient and they're, they're, um, they're deep and dark and scary. And that is definitely in the fiber of that culture in that section of the world. And so one of the themes, one of the story threads that exists in a lot of the features and television shows that are being produced out of Germany these days is somehow involved the forest, legends of the forest, legendary creatures that reside in the forest, the scariness of the forest, and the fact that the the other or the supernatural exists outside in that realm and somehow they have to uh, stay safe and insulated from it i think it's very interesting and and I've, I've seen a number of series that reflect those values so i i and and i'm just now starting to get sort of hip to the ones that have been produced in spain i've seen a couple of those um uh catalog cards on on my netflix feed already as recommendations i haven't got around to them because i have so much to look at but um I, you know i'm excited about it because i think you know one of my major criticisms of network television in the last gosh even the last 20 years i think is that it, it has simply gotten stale with our own sort of inbred recycled cultural narratives uh, and we have to get out of it. We have to break that cycle because we need an infusion of new ideas and new blood and new inspiration and new vitality in, in a lot of our stories that are now becoming, you know, threaded into our culture. Um, just so we can, you know, so we can avoid some of the stigmas and problems that we're experiencing as, a, as an American society currently. You know, a lot of the problems that we're experiencing with divisions and ideologies and divisiveness is the very idea that we have some folks who are committed to growth and change and new narratives and welcoming new ideas and, and new cultural dimensions to our society. And then we have those who are re resistant to those things. And if you're resistant to those things and if you're resistant to change, I don't see how you can be effective in a creative industry in virtually any capacity without the introduction of new ideas. Otherwise, how do you evolve as a creative? So um, that's another good aspect of Netflix that it's an excellent point that you bring up is we're starting to get these ideas from other places and not necessarily, you know, insular recycled ideas from, you know, old American tropes and values that are, that need to be sort of looked at and, and reevaluated. So that's a, that's an excellent point that you bring up. So, um, um, Professor yeah, Walsh, I, yes, yeah, I have a friend in this class who just messaged me saying that she's not able to get into the room. Is it Abigail? Yes, I just admitted her. I it gotcha. just popped up and I hit the button, so we should see her here shortly. Uh, but thank you for that. Um, that's good. I'm I'm getting the window now. I wasn't getting it last uh, last week for some reason, but it seems like I'm getting it now. So. Um, so let me start with this little presentation. It's not too long because um, I want to talk to you today about getting your foot in the door. So um, has everybody uh, submitted their story ideas, the assignment from week 1B? Okay, good. Excellent. So um, 
what we want to do now is we want to get a sense of those ideas and we want to see if we can help through workshopping and through discussion uh, what your um, what your best idea is and, and you can develop that for your uh, broadcast script. So uh, the, 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 the theme of this is getting your foot in the door and I want to talk to you about pitching, specifically story pitching. Um, uh, before I do that, let me just mention really quick, um, this will probably be, you know, the last time I have this, um, this slide up for my lectures, and that is to just quickly remind you now of the important dates that have transpired here. Um, Friday was um, your financial aid deadline. You were supposed to have your financial aid assignments turned in by then. If you haven't, I think that, you know, they continue to take them. Uh, and if you've done it in another class, I think you're okay. But um, I think they'll continue to take them up to like the 27th in in, in reality. Uh, but they want everybody to have it in by the 15th so you get your, your FAFSA payments on time and on schedule. So let's uh, make sure that you have those all turned in if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to do this too. I'm going to put my phone on uh, airplane mode really quick so we don't get interrupted here. Um, there we go. I got interrupted three times in my last lecture. So um, so that was the 15th, ad drop was the 15th. Uh, the only uh, you know important deadline we have coming up now would be obviously your withdrawal deadline of March 26th uh, in the event that for some reason you're not doing well in this class, which frankly would be a, a virtual impossibility if, if you do nothing more than turn in the assignments. Um, uh, I want you guys to get a good grade in here and I want to reinforce your confidence about your writing. What I don't want to do is stifle your creativity um, by, um, uh, you know, by being too um, overbearing in the grading process here. Um, our last day of school, I guess, is April 26th. And so we'll have a study day on the 27th, I guess. I'll schedule a Zoom and, and we can gather for that. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have some kind of a midterm for you on February 25th. Uh, we just had MLK Day yesterday, so that's that's a done deal. And then obviously spring break is going to come in the in the 11th hour here uh, on April 11th through the 17th. So you're going to have a one week break, and then you're going to come back for a week, and then you're going to and then you're going to break for the summer. So um, so that's the uh, spring calendar here at UCF. I want to now give you guys a concept. Content is king, okay? So that's kind of an old saying that we have uh, in Hollywood, content is king. Um, in the early part of my career, I, I um, obviously I was young and I was learning and, and it was all new to me. And so uh, I placed a great deal of emph emphasis on learning my craft, um, knowing my job, doing my job well, um, and then building up a resume and building up a reputation. Um, and that's all good because you need those things if you're if you're you know pursuing a job, uh, you know, in order to keep your job and to uh, be able to pay your bills and continue to do what you love, you got to be good at your job and competitive. But there's a more important theme that you know that resume that resonates in Hollywood, and that is that the content is the most important thing. Everything that we do serves the content. It serves the movie, serves the story, right? And so therefore the stories are the most powerful um, building block of this whole process without it. And if it's no good, then the movie has doesn't stand a chance, right? No matter how good of a cinematographer you are, no matter how good of a lighting person or a grip you are, no matter how beautiful your sets are, um, you know, whatever that concern or discipline may be, if the story is terrible, the audience will not, you know, they'll not show up, they'll not support it, right? So the content is king. If you got good content, you know, uh, you're going to be highly sought after. If you can write good stories with compelling characters, you're going to have uh, plenty of work. So that's the notion that I want to start instilling in you now is the content itself, the, the script specifically or the novel, you know, the script based on the novel or the novel itself, which is the new thrust, uh, incidentally, in Hollywood, is they don't want you to, they don't want to take a meeting with you if you have a spec script, right? They want to take a meeting with you if you have written a novel 
uh, with compelling characters that they can turn into a mini series or that they can turn into a series of feature films, right? They want to meet the, the JK Rowlings and they want to meet the J.R.R. Tolkien's and they want to meet the, uh, who's the other one that wrote the Game of Thrones? They want to meet the George Martins and they want to meet, uh, you know, think of, you know, if you're a, a, an avid fiction reader, think of your favorite writer, uh, who that might be. And, um, you know, think about the, you know, if they have a story catalog, you know, um, that those are, those are the people that are being pursued in Hollywood right now, because what they're looking for is the ability to make several movies based on the same characters in different situations that they can, you know, create feature films from or uh, long running TV series. Uh, and they don't want just one idea anymore, which is really interesting because for a long time that was the focus, not only of all of these, you know, writing for film classes that have been part of film programs forever, but, uh, you know, the, the common, you know, the conventional wisdom of the industry was you write a, you know, you write a spec script and you shop it around town until somebody reads it and they really like what you've done and they turn it into a movie. Um, they're not, they're not really they're not really looking for that anymore from the young folks. They'll take that from an experienced writer, right? So if Lawrence Kasdan, who's been writing scripts forever, has a one-off and he wants to shop it around town, he's going to get read because he's Lawrence Kasdan, you know? I mean, he's, you know, he's written all kinds of stuff, including, you know, rewriting and, and, uh, and penning, you know, the Star Wars movie and, and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, you know, he's going to get read if he's got a one-off. Um, uh, you know, there are, you know, Christopher Nolan will probably get read, although he doesn't write with his brother anymore. And some people say that was the more creative writer than, than Nolan himself, Christopher himself. But arguably, if he had a script to shop around and it was a one-off, he'd probably get read. Um, you know, there's folks out there that'll still do the spec script and, and get read, but they're the ones that have a well-established track record um, and, uh, you know, the proven money makers. Uh, but if you're new and starting out, the thrust now might be, for instance, to write TV scripts and, you know, come up with a story concept for a series and start writing scripts based on that series concept, right? So you're coming up with new script ideas, but they're all based around the same central characters in the same world, right? And you're just offering new scenarios uh, based on those, uh, on those um, elements and you know showing your flexibility and showing your range within a series of scripts that use the same central themes and characters um that's what that's what they call intellectual property in hollywood right now ip is so what i could do here is i could change this and i could say content is king or i could scratch out content and i could put ip intellectual property is king right your character specifically right so think about that. That's a really important notion that's evolving out there in Hollywood right now. And I got, I got a friend who calls me every week and, and, you know, vents his frustration about, you know, uh, you know, finding IP that, uh, you know, that he can produce and he can pitch to studios and, and looking for and, uh, and, and pitching book deals and, and trying to acquire uh, rights to existing um, novels and so forth so that they can start the process of development on these things and turn them into shows. So uh, it's a whole new way of looking at the industry out there. And I, I think it's pretty exciting um, because I think that you have more flexibility as a writer of a novel, for instance, than you do as a writer of a script, especially if you're a, a new writer of scripts, what they'll frown on from a new writer is camera directions, um, any sort of um, suggested actions or attitudes on the part of the uh, characters in the form of parentheticals. Um, they don't want to see stuff like that from you. They want to see, you know, basic, good structural bones for your script that can be fleshed in by other collaborators in the process, like the directors and the producers and everybody like that. So I find script writing actually more restrictive than actual uh, story writing, like novels and short stories. Um, and, 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 and ironically, there's the thrust. They're looking for exactly that IP, short, short stories, uh, novels, novellas, uh, things of that nature, and then scripts last, ironically. Um, on that note, if you want to see a script, for instance, if you're interested um, in reading the script from your favorite movie, you can go to Internet Movie Script Database, 
which is a lot like internet movie database, which is all about who's who in the industry. This is just about scripts and, and some of the scripts that I've pulled down for us to use later in the semester, I pulled down in their entirety with log lines and direction and everything uh, from this website. So keep that in mind, the internet movie script database uh, might be a really huge help for you. If you, if you're just looking to see who your, you know, who your, you know, who your favorite writers are, writing about or what their what their style looks like what their what their log lines look like what their action lines look like um you know you can pull down their scripts and have a look at them there's virtually I, I, on this website i haven't i haven't inquired yet and been denied a script so it's it's a pretty broad catalog as far as i can tell um, there might be some stuff that's not on there yet and then you have to you know hunt it down from other sources but um, i found it to be pretty reliable so far so i thought i'd pass that on to you today i want to talk uh, about pitching um, and really um, i don't have really that much to say about it i got a few things to show you um, i think the concept is probably pretty you know recognizable and and understandable by you folks already um, I've got a, a website though to talk to you about, which is called Script Revolution. Uh, it's out of the UK, and the um, the fellow from the video that I uh, wanted you folks to watch for this week, Shane Stanley, is a big advocate of the ScriptRevolution.com website, and it's pretty cool. I'll go to it, and we can look around a little bit if you want to. Um, it's got a lot of how tos, um, and it's got a lot of great advice and a lot of um, uh, illustrative content um, that demonstrates, you know, good script writing, uh, the techniques, the how to's, and then it's also a script bank, people can upload their content to script revolution uh, for um, public feedback, which is really, which is really cool. So uh, I like that a lot. I'm, I've given you some PDFs to check out script notes. This is uh, really going to be more for um, uh, Thursday and into next week, but I wanted to give them to you ahead of time about uh, from scriptnotes.com. It's um, a discussion about the antagonist, the protagonist, and then the uh, finding your character's wound. And we'll talk about that uh, in a week or so. Um, and then there's going to be an assignment that I want to have you guys do uh, based on what I'm going to show you for uh, next class, if possible, so we can workshop it here live. But it, I'll, I'll make the deadline later than that. I think I made the deadline um, Friday night or Sunday night. I, I can't remember which. Um, the pitches aren't hard, and I don't and I don't need an extensive package like I'm going to show you. There's a lot of stuff you can put in a pitch. Uh, I'm just going to want the basics, and I provide for you also a um, a template, a pitch template uh, as a downloadable PDF. So um, we'll, we'll talk about. We'll take a look at that as well. And then on Thursday. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, another worksheet that I've, I've got for you called the character dossier, which is going to help you uh, start thinking about your characters in your story and maybe what their backstory is, what their character traits are, um, you know, details about them, age, weight, you know, physical characteristics and so forth, but also questions about what their inner motivations and outer motivations might be. Um, and so if you look at, like, for instance, the outline of the class, um, you might start seeing sort of a trend here, which is uh, we're going to go through these concepts kind of chronologically. So in the first week, we talked about just coming up with some story ideas. Uh, and we talked about what the basic structure was, and we reviewed what you learned in story writing about um, uh, Aristotle's poetics and the three-act structure. And so we started there, and then uh, I think the next natural step is you got a good idea and you have a really good sense of what the story is, and you want to pitch it to somebody. And the reason you'll pitch it before you, there's a couple of ways of doing this. You can approach the problem of pitching by creating the entire script ahead of time, or you can come up with your treatment in other words, the essence of your story and a few critical details that will um, that will really interest your audience, which at this stage in the game, your audience will be the studio producers, the ones who may fund and green light your project. They're your audience at this stage in the game. Just enough information for them to sort of whet their appetite. And that's kind of the the the, the 
the the nugget of wisdom in Shane Stanley's video. He's talking about how producers don't have time to read a you know 120 page script about a two hour feature film and take a meeting with you. That's just too much work for them when they're trying to pack as many of these meetings in per day per week as they can because they're casting a wide net looking for things that they can produce that will be effective stories that they know will appeal to their audience or that fit into their brand already if they're the kind of channel that has certain kinds of films already uh it's consistent with what they show their audience on a regular basis and therefore they understand the audience will be built in um so the pitch is really about a synopsis and it's about um, a character dossier. It's about something we're going to talk about in uh, next week called a beat sheet, where you sort of talk about your story in broad brushstrokes with enough detail that you can excite a producer sitting at the other side of the table from you in a, in a quick pitch meeting, but not so specific that you're going to get mired in the details of your story or your script. Okay. And then what it, what it can do is it can get you on the payroll a lot quicker, right? Would you rather spend six months to a year creating all these documents and writing a full script and then pitching it, hoping you get hired? Or would you rather pitch them in the early stages based on your good ideas and treatments uh, and then get them to put you on payroll to finish the idea as a full as a full length script? I think the latter is the more desirable situation to be in, right? If you're going to spend all that time writing that script, it'd be nice to be on the payroll while you're doing it. So I think that's the other, the other wisdom about a pitch session is uh, if they like you, if they like your story idea and they like, you know, the things you say in your, your character dossiers and your beat sheets and stuff, uh, then they're probably going to give you a contract to finish that script, you know, and when it's done, Here's your, uh, here's your payment, or they might buy your idea. They might pay for your pitch idea uh, so they can develop it themselves. Like for instance, let's say, uh, you know, you walk in there with a really amazing story concept that nobody's thought of yet. You know, how um, a high school science teacher who was actually a Nobel prize winning scientist could end up with such a mediocre life that he's teaching high school chemistry um, and he discovers that he has cancer. And so his idea of getting out of his dilemma is to start making crystal meth and selling it on the streets and making a ton of money that he can leave behind to his family after he dies of lung cancer, right? And you walk in with that pitch idea to you know a studio exec and they say, oh my God, that's that's such a fresh and unique idea. We've never had any kind of story like that on our network before. I'll tell you what, you know, we'll offer you $50,000 for this treatment. Um, I don't know you. I'm not sure if you can even write a script. And quite frankly, I've got enough script writers on staff already, but I'm willing to pay you 50 K right now for your idea. You know, that's the other thing that can come out of his pitch meeting is you get paid for the idea, you know, and then your job is done. You know, so there's a couple of advantages to the pitch meeting, and I want to sort of reinforce those ideas today. So, uh, so here we are. Um, this is, interestingly enough, um, this is an event that they hold annually out in Los Angeles. It's called Pitch Fest. And what it is, is they get about uh, 50 or more industry execs um, and they get them in the LA convention center and everybody gets a table and, and a few chairs. Um, and as you see here, uh, attendees buy tickets to pitch fest and the attendees uh, are likely individuals who have content that they want to sell. They've either got a, a, you know, a dynamite treatment or they got a spec script or they've got a whole pitch package uh, that includes uh, some fully fleshed out scenes or a few episodes of a half hour comedy, let's let's say, or something of that uh, along those lines. And they come with their with their portfolio to Pitch Fest, and they go from table to table to table. And there's like a it's like speed dating. There's like a five minute window, and you sit down and you and you pitch that exact right. And at the end of your time, you know. Uh, they ask you for a meeting next week, 
or they say, thanks a lot. I appreciated your pitch. Uh, and they're on to the next person, right? So it's a really interesting event. Um, I got I got a friend who goes to it every year uh, and he pays the, you know, uh, I, I think last year he paid $400 to go to Pitch Fest. Um, but for that money, you know, he had access to, you know, 50 or more studio execs who were buying, okay? And that's the really important thing. It's like, it wasn't 50 studio execs that they could scrape together from, you know, the furthest recesses of the industry, you know, uh, Joe Blow's studio, you know, and so forth. These are actually working studios and production companies who are actively buying. And that's how they get on the roster to be part of uh, the Pitch Fest, um, what would you call them? Uh, gang of exhibitors, right? Um, and then that, you know, the notion that everybody that is, you know, exhibiting at Pitch Fest uh, is a bona fide buyer uh, that adds value to the cost of admission to everybody who's buying tickets to come and pitch their stuff. So it's an interesting event. That's just one way of going about this process. And keep in mind that it is, it's a timed process. It's like you get five minutes, three to five minutes, and then that's it. And they're on to the next person, right? Because they might get several thousand attendees, right? So you can't sit there and camp out all day and try to win them over with your personality. You either, you've either got a good idea or you don't. And, and, and if they don't want it, it's like next, you know? So this is Pitch Fest. Um, and I wanna to talk to you about what, you know, the kinds of things that you might have prepared for something like Pitch Fest. Um, so a television pitch is, uh, it's a comprehensive, I'm saying here a comprehensive document, but it's really a set of documents. It can be several things and you're gonna find out what those things are. It includes um, uh, log lines uh, from your script. It might include a world Bible or a show Bible, we call it, which is a document that contains all kinds of stuff. Like I did the TV series uh, that spun off of the movies, uh, Mortal Kombat. And uh, for Mortal Kombat, we had uh, in the Bible, we had all kinds of stuff. We had uh, cinematography notes. We had uh, lighting diagrams. Like when we did um, Shao Kahn's uh, lair, you know, his cave, you know, there were documents that detailed how that lighting is, is constructed and the colored gels that we used to create the effects and the kinds of lights we were using and diagrams of where those lights were. So there were lighting diagrams or camera diagrams talking about what lenses, you know, because you don't just shoot randomly, uh, you know, your characters in a specific context. You know, Shao Kahn had this really interesting kind of makeup and, and he sat in this giant bone shaped throne and he was in this, in this world that was supposed to be another dimension. And so there were color considerations, there were um, compositional considerations. And, you know, we would never shoot Shao Kahn on certain kinds of lenses. You know, there were certain lenses that gave us the right perspective on his character, either the flatness and, and tightness of a long lens or the extreme close up of a wide angle to accentuate his weird skeletal uh, makeup and so forth. So there were rules about how to shoot Shao Kahn, right? You didn't just go in and shoot him, right? There were certain things that we did. And all that kind of stuff was in a Bible. Now, you're not going to be responsible for that kind of information early on, but your show Bible could have maps. It could have world description documents. Like, um, let's say you were writing Lord of the Rings. You know, you might, have, um, you might have a series of documents that describes Middle Earth and where things are, who is in Middle Earth, who, who are the people in Middle Earth, wh you know, what are their concerns, what's life like, you know, a map of Middle Earth. Um, you know, sketches and drawings of characters and places from the world that you're creating that give a producer a, sort of a sense of what you have, what you're imagining in your head. So that's what we call a show Bible. Um, you'll have a rough outline of your story. You'll, you might have a, a pilot script already completed if it's a TV series. Um, so there's a number of things, these character dossiers is another thing that you would have in here. Um, and, and a few other things uh, that demonstrate uh, your show's core ideas. And in the process, they also do something really, really important, which is they demonstrate your own writing style, right? So everything that you create should have your voice 
sort of baked into it, right? And your voice is the style with which you like to write. So let's say um, you were writing, uh, uh, well, how about, um, what's that TV series uh, where the girl disappears in the Standing Stones and ends up in uh, 16th century Ireland? Um, you know, everything that, you know, she writes in her show Bible might be written in, you know, an old English dialect, you know, uh, just something that adds tone and flair to the documents, you know, and that might be a little trick that, you know, she uses in her show Bible, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, it, it also reflects itself in the, in the tone uh, and the style of the dialogue that the characters uh, are using in the show itself, okay? So whatever your particular thing is, you know, your, your, sort of trademark or your, um, I don't want to call them idiosyncrasies, but maybe that's a good word, you know, uh, your voice, your, your style is going to be reflected in these documents as well. And they want to get a sense of that. I don't think, and it hasn't been demonstrated to me, that producers are necessarily frightened of new inexperienced writers. They understand that, you know, like all good ecosystems or communities uh, from time to time, you must have an infusion of new genes in the gene pool or the community is going to get stale and stagnant, right? And so the same old writers who get stuck in routines and have habits and who tend to write about the same concepts and characters, after a while, the audiences sort of get tired of that and they are, they're looking for something fresh. So the studios and the, and the producers understand that they've got to hire new blood once in a while. But what they want is they want to feel secure about their choices. And they want to know that, you know, the person that came in with this really great idea is also probably a very competent writer and could possibly be someone that they could call upon to, you know, perform more than supply them a pitch idea. So uh, I want to talk to you about pitching a TV show. So there's a really great uh, section on Studio Binder, and I've pulled a couple of their templates down for you guys to work with. Uh, it's not bad. You can check out their whole sort of uh, thing here on uh, studiobinder.com in their blog about how to pitch a TV show. Uh, but the salient points are these. There's four components of a television show pitch. We want your log line, which is what's your show about in essence? What's your premise, right? Um, and then they want an elevator pitch package, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. Uh, that's going to that's going to comprise a short summary. Uh, it's going to be basically in a couple of sentences what your show is about. Um, it needs to demonstrate your core concepts, and then it has to be catchy. It has to have a hook to it. You know, it's got to be. It's almost like a um, an ad line, you know, for a brand, you know, what's the hook? What's the idea you're going to capture your audience with? And, and then in this case, obviously, the audience is the buyer, the producer from the studio. OK, um, here's uh, Vince Gilligan's um, log line for Breaking Bad. A terminal terminal diagnosis leads a cash strapped loving father to the hostile world of illicit drug manufacture and its deadly associations. That's his log line for Breaking Bad. And, um, you know, I think it's capturing the essence of what that show is about. The only thing it doesn't really describe is um, the fact that he's a Nobel Prize winning chemist teaching science for high school. And that was part of the ironic um, uh, situations affecting this character was, you know, um, all of his colleagues were highly successful corporate chemists, and he ended up teaching high school, making 40 grand a year, uh, while all of his, his former colleagues were becoming independent, independently wealthy corporatists. Um, that adds some flavor to the TV show. I think you'll agree. Um, maybe even a political slant that is salient even now. Um, you're going to have a one sheet. Um, and this is, they're calling it something between a resume and a condensed version of your idea. Uh, it's going to give the executive something to think about uh, and remember you by after you've left the meeting. So it's, this is a skillful leave behind, right? Your one sheet. 
um, it's better than a it's better than a business card because just knowing your name and the fact that you met with you know uh, the the Sony studio rep on Tuesday afternoon at 1:30 is you know not going to get you a call back. But if you give them a one sheet about the pitch that you gave them with your contact information on it, boom, that's what you really want to have prepared so that after your meeting, which only going to last, like I said, three to five minutes, there's something lingering there on his desk or her desk that they can, while they're shuffling papers or cleaning up their desk before they go to lunch or leave to go to home at night, they'll see it and remind them that they had the meeting with you and what that meeting was about. And the fact that they actually, the fact that they didn't crumple it up and throw it in the can the minute you left the room and they left it on their desk meant that they wanted to think about it some more. Okay. So this is just something to, to keep you vivid in their memory. Okay. And the notion is that executives hear hundreds of pitches a week. You know, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure how accurate hundreds is in the course of a week. Um, but the idea is that you have to make a good first impression. And that might be the only opportunity you get uh, to gain access to that individual at that particular studio. So you want to you know, maximize your maximize your effect. OK, the one sheets should have your name and your contact details, elements of your pitch, uh, the name of your story, the genre of your of your story or your world. Uh, the log line that describes the essence of your show, in other words, the premise or the uh, um, the underlying thread, the story thread. Uh, and then it might have relevant biographical information about you. For instance, maybe you're pitching a, a studio exec and it's not the first time you've sold a show, right? Maybe it's a show that they bought, but they never actually produced. But the fact that you actually pitched and sold a concept to say Warner Brothers and you did it last year. Now you're sitting in Paramount this year talking to the exec. You want them to know, you know what? I've done this before. I've had success before. So somebody else in the industry has sort of vetted my bona fides by buying something that I wrote, right? So that's the kind of information also uh, in, in summary and in, in, in brief uh the kind of stuff you want to include in your uh one sheet and then you're going to create your bible it's going to be comprehensive um you're going to draw from it when you do your pitch uh it's going to have detail uh, all sorts of details from your world from your ip details about characters the dramatic arc of the characters or the arc of the story throughout a season and a tv series um they're saying that it should be no less than seven pages. Um, so seven to 10 pages is a good start on a show Bible. And then it's going to get thicker from there. The more you think about it and write about it, the more scripts you create, the more situations you start thinking are suitable for your characters is going to expand that document into this giant, you know, show Bible that will become uh, a valuable asset to the filmmakers when they go into principal photography because they can consult that Bible all the time for, you know, anything they want to know, you know, particularly a director with actors, you know, when an actor says, I don't know if my character would behave this way, or I don't know if my character would say this thing the way it's written in the script. And then you can go to the show Bible and you can go to that character in the dossiers and say, well, very early on in the concept of this show, the writers had a, a theme for this character and the dialogue in this episode is very consistent with the stuff that they wrote for us in the Bible. So I think it's okay. You got to give me your best, you know, um, exposition or your best performance uh, and trust that the writers know what's best for this character, right? So the Bibles can be a, a very effective uh, and important tool. Um, so you'll have all kinds of stuff in there, character development, story arc developments, breakdowns of episodes, um, episode scripts, um, all kinds of stuff. And like I said, lighting diagrams, camera details, all that. Um, here's the Studio Binder uh, homepage if you wanna go to that, um, creating a pitch. Uh, this one is for specifically about the story Bible. The other one, the other web page is about the, the pitch itself. This is about creating the story Bible. <clears throat> And here again, is the they use the example of Breaking Bad as well. So they're calling the pilot script um, uh, as an important part of your um, pitch uh, document. And it should be a finished pilot um, to give the studio a really strong sense of what your show is about. And the pilot is where you do things like you define the world. 
uh, and the characters in it, you start um, describing the character's constraints or limitations. You might reveal the character's flaws or wounds. Um, you are revealing their, um, their traits and tendencies. Um, and then you're presenting the first sort of um, change, inciting incident, uh, or new situation that is going to sort of kick off the season as part of your first your first story. Okay. Um, script revolution. This is it. So this is what the homepage looks like. Um, and they've got a particular um, exercise in here and it's called the turn and burn uh, module. And it's it's a it's a whole package of um, recommendations and best practices uh, centered on the concept of building better screenplays that sell. Okay, and there's a number of different you know lists and menus that you can access. If I go to this website here, let's see if I can access it from here. Um, add link as a web page and then open the link. So let's see if we can do that. Oops. And we'll go to, uh, here we go. So here it is. Uh, nope, that's not it either, is it? That's something totally different. Did I? Let's craft a digital. Let's just do it here. Let's go um, script revolution. Okay, so, okay, all these pull downs have really great stuff that you can check out. So scripts, uh, here are all the scripts that are on the website, the stuff that people are looking for uh, advice and feedback on. Um, and you can browse just the new scripts that week or you can browse the whole catalog. Um, it has in uh, education, here's where the turn and burn screen, screenwriting guide is. And if you go to the turn and burn section, Okay, it's going to talk to you about all these different things, concept building, story structure, scene writing, characters, subtext, formatting, software, okay, all these different things. Each one of these links leads to a different page. Um, you know, in the in the weeks ahead, when we talk about subtext, you know, you might see some of this uh, reproduced in my uh, in my class presentation talking about you know, uh, the subtext worksheet, what's the most literal version of what that character is saying. Okay, what is that care? What is that? What is the meaning behind that character's dialogue or actions uh, in terms of su subtext in terms of story. Um, so we're going to use this as a tool. I've looked through the website. I think it's pretty good. Um, it's fairly unique in what it's offering and it was started by um, A feature writer in the UK who was interested in, um, you know, sharing and education and so forth. So it's a pretty interesting resource for you. Uh, and then, of course, I got Judd Apatow's uh, Tips for Pitching. I don't know if you guys know who he is. Um, he he produced that uh, TV series uh, Girls on HBO, which I thought was really clever. Um, it's where we got Adam, um, Adam uh, uh, the kid who went on to become uh, in the Star Wars films there. Um, uh, gosh, his last name escapes me. But, Adam Driver. Um, Yes, Adam Driver. Thank you very much. Yes, so Adam Driver was the um, kind of the goofy boyfriend uh, in that in that series, Girls on HBO. Judd produced that, amongst uh, many other things. He's an interesting character, and he's got some very uh, interesting points of view on pitching. So he's going to say to you, keep it short, um, make it marketable, make it emotional, um, and then sell yourself. Right? Describe your story in three minutes or less. Right, because if you got a five minute meeting, you know, pleasantries and greetings are going to take up the first minute and then thanks for coming by and do you have a card and do you have a one sheet It's going to take up the last minute of your meeting that leaves three minutes in between for you to make your point and make it well and, and make a good impression so make your make your pitch three minutes or less. Um, you should be thinking about how your story can be marketed and the only way you're going to know that is to research 
the studios that you're approaching for a meeting, right? So if you go to Fox to pitch a TV show, you might want to research the Fox network, the other types of shows that they are promoting on their network and the type of audience that watches uh, Fox programming so that you're not a bad match for what they're trying to do over there. Um, and so you should have a mind for the marketing of your material and don't go to a studio um, you know, that is like, for instance, you know, don't go to f the Fox network with a TV show that's going to have, um, um, obvious and outward facing, you know, left leaning liberal values, right? Because it's probably not going to get produced on Fox because that's not where their audience resides you know uh, ideologically and thematically right it's i it's ironic that this that the simpsons uh or that um uh, family guy were on uh, fox for as long as they were because they are the antithesis of well at least family guy is the antithesis of the fox uh ideology but um so the idea would be you know don't take your material there if you you know if you're writing you know about certain kinds of themes uh that might not fit with their branding uh or their mission um your story your stories uh are uh um uh, um jesus i'm mouth i'm i'm short circuiting here uh apato's uh suggestion is that you have a strong emotional uh through line in your in your material um and 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 his his thoughts are that uh the way to resonate with an audience is emotionally uh not intellectually right so um you know, where a show might be about, you know, cops and stuff, um, that's pretty, um, you know, that's pretty cut and dry. It's, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's, um, what are they, they got a name for it. Um, it's, you know, it's very structured. It's, um, you know, it's procedural programming, they call it. In other words, uh, cops do things a certain way. They have certain ways of investigating, certain ways of making arrests, certain ways of going about getting warrants and search warrants and, and arrest warrants and so forth. And so all of that is sort of intellectual information that uh, will interest your audience for about five minutes and then they're going to turn the channel. Um, but if one of your cops is a raging alcoholic or if one of your cops is a, is a, uh, a heroin addict, right? Or if one of your cops uh is blind okay i did a show about a cop who was blind it's like how can a cop be blind i don't know but i'll bet she's going to have some interesting experiences in his episodes right so you know if you can somehow attach an emotional response to your story that resonates with your audience that you're going to keep them drawn in and engaged for a lot longer than simple simple procedural exposition right um Make sure that you walk into the meeting with a sense of how the story is going to end, right? Uh, now, the interesting thing about episodic and serialized content, and that's something that um, you would have read about um, in your TV drama series uh, readings, for instance, is that a feature film has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? It has an end, even if it's a sequel to something. It's, it has an end, and presumably that end could be interpreted as a finality or it could be interpreted loosely as, well, maybe he didn't really die. Maybe he only fell off the mountain and grabbed a root on the way, but we didn't see that in the ending of the film. And he's going to come back in yet another sequel where surprise of surprises, the hero didn't actually die, right? Um, outside of those parameters, a TV show that wants to run for seven seasons is not going to kill off all of the important characters in season one, right? They're going to find a way for those characters to escape their ultimate demise so that they can come back for season two. Okay. Which is one of the reasons why Game of Thrones had such critical acclaim uh, for their first season. Because what did Game of Thrones do at the end of their first season? Anybody remember? Uh, they killed off Ned Stark. <laughs> They killed Ned, the biggest actor on that roster for that show, right? Sean Bean. They cut his head off. And, and everybody was like, 
what the hell? How, how do you kill the main character at the end of season one? Well, they had an idea, right? And they knew before, well before we did. And where the only place you would have known this would have been if you had been privy to the show Bible was that the story wasn't really about Ned, even though they kind of wrapped every episode around what Ned thinks and what Ned's doing and what Ned's philosophy is and how Ned raised his kids, right? But they knew that the story wasn't really about Ned. It was about Snow, right? And so when they killed off Sean Bean, everybody went nuts. And then, of course, they're like, well, I got to know now what, you know, what's going to happen with this show. I got to go back and see at least episode one of season two to find out how they're going to, how they're going to, you know, get out of this one, you know. Ned's going to come back as a zombie. Ah, that's it, because they showed a zombie in the first episode. That must be what happens. Ned's a zombie. Great. We'll show up for season two, you know. It was totally opposite of what anybody would have expected in, in, a, in a TV show. And then, of course, it had, you know, it went, it went ahead to be, you know, fabulously successful. So um, if you have a sense of where your show is going beyond the pilot in the first few episodes, even maybe beyond the first season, that's something that you want to put in your Bible and in your pitch package so you can explain that to an exec and you can say, look, man, this this show, if you approve this idea, is going to take you uh, seven years into the future of you know successful programming if we can capture and keep your audience because I've got ideas that are going to last us for that for that long. You know, I got 56 episodes uh, already concepted out and I got the first season of scripts already already prepared. You know, these are strong offerings to walk into an exec's office with. Um, so the people listening to your pitch, they not only uh, have to like it, they have to like you, right? So at all times, remember, you're not just selling your story. You're also selling you as a writer, you as a as the concept creator right you're the one who gave birth to this idea and therefore you are somebody that they might want to consider having keeping around you know um, like even though george rr R. martin wrote all the novels you know hbo still had those other two guys uh writing the working scripts for every episode and they they started working from his source material and then when when he ran out of source material that's when they started freelancing it and started you know blowing up the whole show concept in many people's opinion but uh at least in the beginning they kept george around because you know he was the source of all the information they could ask him questions about would this character really do this especially when they were in uncharted, uncharted territory in other words when they were starting to write scripts that were beyond what he had already committed to the page uh, because as you know, he wasn't uh, actually done with the with the series before the series caught up with uh, all of his source material and they had to start winging it, you know. Um, so, you know, it's good sometimes to keep an individual an individual like that on the payroll if they're a good source of, you know, informa information and inspiration to the writers. So you're selling them on you and your concept. If they don't, and if they don't understand uh, uh, your project, um, <laughs> he says they might ruin it anyway. Um, so, you know, you want to sell them on you uh, so that maybe you'll get a job writing scripts, or at least if you're not the showrunner, at least you'll, you'll, you'll get a job in the writer's room uh, and you can contribute uh, each week to the creation of each subsequent script. So, um, that's the philosophy behind the pitch. If we look at the um, if we look at the homework assignment, hello, there we go. Modules. For this week, I'm asking you to start creating pitches from your story ideas so if we go to the assignment you'll see here draw from the ideas that you generated last week and create three pitches using the tv show template so take your ideas and start fleshing them out into the template what's the template look like the template you can download it here and it's also in your downloadable pdfs page but if i open it up for you right here 
this is what it looks like. So TV show pitch template. Okay. And it's going to ask you some specific questions. What's your show title? Um, are you the creator? Are you working with a writing partner? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, what's the background and uh, key credits or aspects of this thing? Um, this is where you're going to, um, okay, this is about you, background and key credits for you, uh, not your story. So you're going to tell them, uh, you know, it's been said that you should never introduce yourself as a student. You should always introduce yourself as a writer because there's there's lots of different writers at different stages in their development, right? And the fact that you're a student doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a competent writer. So in this section here, you probably don't want to tell them that you're a student uh, unless you, you know, for the sake of this exercise, you could say I'm a, you know, I'm a BFA student at University of Central Florida. Uh, however, I have written these things and, you know, notable awards, like if you've, if you've written something and submitted it to a, um, uh, a screenwriting competition, for instance, uh, and you won uh, honorable mention or you won a prize in that competition, you might want to put that here. These, this is your bona fides, okay? Um, the next page, um, the format. Okay. So describe what the format of your show is in a few sentences. Is it a half hour comedy? Is it a one hour drama? Um, is it a, is it a serialized, um, mini series? What's the format of your show idea? Okay. And then your log line. Remember we looked at Vince Gilligan's log line for, um, breaking bad. So what's your story through line? What's your premise that goes here. Okay. Um, love conquers all is a little bit too broad of a, of a show premise, right? Um, so you want to be a little bit more succinct in what the notion or theme of your show is. Okay. So while love conquers all is pretty broad, you might say, uh, love conquers all in the midst of the 19th century Russian revolution okay, that's different, you know, that's giving us a little bit more to think about, okay? And, and then the possibilities start becoming a little bit more clear. Um, think about your log line, it's really important, okay? Um, what's the basic synopsis of your show? And, and as you can see here, the, the template, look, this is a one line, two, two sentence answer, right? This is a three, four sentence answer. I don't want you to feel like you've got to give me a 10 page document uh, by the end of the week, right? Just fill it in with the salient details of each of your ideas and do one for each of your ideas. So you have a good sense of what they are in the process of doing this simple um, act. You might disqualify one of your own ideas because you may discover that it's just not a strong enough concept. Uh, that's going to carry through for uh, a TV show. And remember, since we're doing, since the first half of this uh, semester is about writing for TV, the assumption is, is that you're you're going to come up with a concept that might last eight episodes. It, it should be at least good for one season on Netflix, right? Um, don't think about this in in the context of MOW. Uh, unless you've got a really good solid idea, then maybe one of your three ideas could be an, M an MOW idea. Um, but you should have at least one idea in here uh, that's an episodic or serialized concept that you can explore a little bit more fully. Uh, so in the beginning, just give me the broad strokes uh, so that we can workshop these things and we can give you some feedback on what those basic ideas are. Okay. Uh, what, what else have we got here? Episodic breakdown. Okay, this is uh, important. So you got a concept about, um, you know, uh, a TV drama, right? Well, what's the pilot about? How, do, how are you going to establish the characters, the world and the situations for the pilot? Well, it's a cop. It's a cop procedural drama, but it's not about normal cops. It's about undercover narcotics cops in Cleveland in 1993. So it's a period drama with cops that are undercover in this place at this time, right? 
and that would be you know a pretty good descriptive beginning for your ideas and then i've you know i've added notes at the bottom here if you want to add any subsequent information um, we're going to add other documents to your total package uh, as assignments in subsequent classes so uh, you don't have to worry about like in the notes the, doing any beats for your story because we're going to talk about and work on beat sheets um, next week um, we're also going to work about on character dossiers next week. So while you might give me some information about your characters in this basic um, pitch template, um, you don't have to get real specific because the dossiers are going to have more information uh, than you would put in this in this particular document anyway. Um, so this is going to be your assignment um, for tonight. And if you can get if you can get this done by Thursday, whoever whoever is completed by Thursday, we can workshop your uh, documents then. Uh, otherwise, I've created the assignment. Um, let me show you. If I go back to modules, so we're here in week two. Here's your story pitches. I want to workshop them on Thursday. And then um, you'll have a, uh, a discussion board where you can workshop each other, okay? So <clears throat> it's a graded discussion, okay? What you'll do is you'll take your pitch template and you'll put it in your response, okay? So uh here here's my pitch template for week two right that you might say that in your response dialogue box and then attach your pitch sheet to that response right and then everybody in the class is going to do the same thing and then you'll go back and respond to two of your classmates okay so in other words open their pitch documents take a look at what they've got give them a sense of which one you liked best you know um, are they, here's some questions that you can ask yourself or that you can, I used to take the questions, uh, and just copy them and put them on my own word doc and then just answer them as I'm looking at my classmates, uh, content and, and answer the questions. Is the title catchy? If so, how have they, uh, listed some of their strongest traits or skills for their characters? Uh, what do they bring to the table? What format are they proposing for their show? Is it for the TV, for web? Is it other? Uh, restate their log line and, and comment on its effectiveness. Would it would it compel you to watch the show? Is their log line effective and in stimulating interest uh, for you as a viewer? Um, and then comment on their sub and on their synopsis. Is it a compelling story? Uh, does it interest you in some way? Uh, what do you think the appeal is? Uh, who do you think the audience might be uh, something like that and just you know jot down you know some quick answers so there's five questions you know there's you know five to ten sentences two paragraphs right and do that for two of your classmates and do that by sunday at midnight right so right down here i've got it highlighted sunday so we'll be midnight. posting all three of our pitches and commenting on all three of the pitches for the other person uh pick their best idea i think of of what they've presented right pick their best idea and answer these questions okay. why did you pick this one what is it about this that you think is good and that's going to give the these authors who whoever among you that it is a sense of which of their three ideas resonated with the class right uh and that and, and well, that doesn't mean that that's the one you have to select to broaden your assignment work with. Uh, it gives you a sense of what, if you th if you think now of your classmates as as your potential audience, it's going to give you a sense of what that audience is interested in hearing from you, uh, and that's good feedback, right? Um, you know, uh, if you write a story about two talking dogs who fall in love and escape from the city to the country, that's one idea. The other idea is a cop drama about a blind cop who's on the um, who's on the drug enforcement agency. Uh, and the, the other story idea is an MOW about, um, you know, the ice queen and uh, the the evil prince who get together and try to conquer the world. And it's a fantasy one off. Right. 
and maybe the entire class says, well, I don't know. I just did nine years of Game of Thrones. I don't think I could handle another MOW about sword and sorcery. And I'm not sold on the idea of a blind cop in the DEA, but I think two dogs who fall in love and escape to the country is a good idea. And that could be really funny. So I like that story. This is why. And then answer the five questions. Okay. okay. And then what about the collaborator portion of the pitch document? Like at this point in the development, if you don't have a collaborator, then it's, you know, market in a, yeah. Uh, NA or, you know, um, yeah. I mean, if you don't have one, you don't have one. Right. Um, so I don't think at that point it's necessarily that important. Uh, personal, uh, you know, um, accomplishments is more important. A little bit about you put your bio in there instead, you know, and stuff, you know, stuff like that. So sell yourself as the creator and, and answer as many of those questions in the template as you can so that you have a sort of a fleshed out document, but don't go crazy. Right. So obviously it's Tuesday, right? And I'm saying by Friday, you should have your pitch documents up on this discussion board to give people a couple of days to respond back uh, and give you some, some good feedback, okay? So what you don't wanna do is submit all of your template, you know, your templates uh, on Sunday night because that doesn't give anybody the opportunity to comment on your work, all right? So this is kind of a two part process. You need to have your, your own stuff posted by Friday night, let's say Friday at midnight, and then you gotta have your two responses by Sunday, okay? So the, the discussion is locked until Friday. So do you want us not to post them until Friday? Um, you think you'll be ready early? If you think so, I'll, I'll change the due date to earlier. I just, uh, I don't wanna pressure folks, but we could do that. Let me go in and I'll do it in real time right now. You can see how that kind of stuff is done. Uh, so I'm going to go in on the due date and instead of making it. Um, the issue is that it's not open until Friday. Yeah, let me. Yeah, OK, I'm in the wrong box. Here we go. Let's open it then available from what's the date today? 19th. Let's make it open now uh, or tomorrow is really tonight at midnight. Um, it'll be open. Okay, so as soon as you get your templates done, you can load them up and get them up there so that, you know, first come first serve, right? Um, you can get your you can get your feedback that much sooner. And I'm closing the whole thing down on uh, Monday of next week so that on Tuesday, we're moving on to new business. Okay, so if you haven't, you know, if you haven't, you, you, sh you should be submitting your final responses by Sunday night. If not, you're late, but I'm giving you, uh, well, yeah, it's the 25th at 1159. So you technically have one day to be late, at which point you'll lose some credit. Um, so you should have everything done by Sunday and you should have your pitches in by no later than Friday to give your, your colleagues a chance to respond, okay? Um, what was the other thing I wanted to say about that? Oh. The other thing that I wanna I wanna emphasize is uh, sometimes what can happen is um, one person gets ten people to respond, and then you have three or four people who have no responses on their discussion post. Okay, the whole idea is for everybody to get some feedback, right? So if you can if you see that one of your colleagues already has two responses move on to somebody that hasn't had any responses yet so that they get some honest feedback and it will and we'll call it a first come first serve kind of thing in other words i'm not going to enforce um groups on you guys you know uh just first come first serve and if you see that somebody's already got two responses uh move on to somebody else if it gets to the point where everybody has two responses, I, I think then everybody's been served. But if if you get on and you and you need to give feedback and you look and everybody's already got two, then just, you know, then it's, you know, do whatever you got to do. Okay, but let's not leave anybody in the discussion without any responses, okay? Um, because A, uh, everybody in the class should get the benefit of feedback from their colleagues and you know, it's not going to instill any confidence in somebody if, you know, week after week they post to the discussions and nobody responds. Okay. Um, so what we, we want to avoid that. And, and so this whole process for you guys should be a confidence builder, uh, not an anxiety builder. Okay. So um, 
if you have any, you know, issues with this, or if it's something still not clear, or if you got questions, just email me and reach out and uh, I'll try to clarify it. But I'm, I'm hoping that I've, I've sort of outlined my expectations. It, this is still, I'm still working out the bugs because it, this is easier to do in person than it is online. Um, because web courses, I can't, I can't fix two separate due dates for the same assignment in web courses, right? So I can't have a, a due date for the initial template and then a sec secondary due date for the responses. It won't let me do that. So um, I, I, it's, it's less than ideal the way this be, is being presented. And if it were face to face, it would be a lot easier for me to, you know, to, to, to manage this situation. Um, it's a little tough to do workshops online, but I, I'm hoping that we can work together and we can be successful at it because I can tell you in my entire graduate experience in creative writing, the one aspect of that education that I found the most valuable was the workshops. Honest to God, the workshops are your audience. It's an audience. It may not be your only audience and it may certainly not be your last audience, but it's certainly a set of eyes that are looking at your work and based on their own personal preferences and experience, they're going to give you some constructive feedback that will help you improve what you're doing. And that's the key. However, we are at writing now at the end of this semester, I'm hoping that you are exponentially better. And the best way I can see to expedite that plan is for you to workshop your material with as many uh, honest and um, constructive uh, colleagues as possible. Okay. Um, so we'll sort of feel our way through this process. If this format works okay, I'll stick with it. If it, you know, if, if it needs to be modified, I'll, I'll figure out, you know, the best way to do that um, so that you guys can get good feedback that helps you get better at writing. Um, because that's really what, what it is. It's, it's, it's about getting better at the craft of writing. Okay. So that's sort of today. Um, if you look at video, the videos to watch section, I've got, uh, if you haven't looked at it already, check out Shane Stanley's uh, 20 minute video about what producers don't want to, what they want to see and what they don't want to read. In other words, he's saying they don't want to read your script, but they want to see your pitch documents. They want to see those things. And so he's talking about that concept. I also have Peter Russell talking again about story structure. And then I have two really um, interesting videos. The first one I think is a really terrific analysis of No Country for Old Men from the point of view of story arc and character arc. Um, and it's only about, I think this is about eight, eight or 10 minutes long. Um, have you guys seen No Country for Old Men? I'm, I'm yeah. getting crickets. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. The first time I saw it, I was just like, okay, you know, um, yeah. Um, but then I started talk. I started watching interviews by uh, the Coen brothers talking about the original book. Um, and interviews by the actors talking about their characters and what they were trying to accomplish. And then I watched it a couple more times and I started really understanding what that movie was really about because on the surface, it's, you know, if you watch it simply as a story about, you know, a, a psychopathic serial killer and, and a redneck cop from, you know, rural Texas, you know, that storyline is, it'll sustain you throughout the entire movie but you leave the theater with a sense of, eh, you know, I've seen better. Uh, until you start understanding what uh, the original novelist was going for and what the underlying subtext of the story is. And that's why each week I want to start talking about these things as we dissect the process of writing, because subtext plays a, a huge role in No Country for Old Men. Okay. And so as you start peeling back the layers of that story, you start to really understand uh, what this movie was about, what the Coen brothers were trying to do. 
uh, the message that they were trying to preserve from the original writer. Uh, interesting stuff. And then here's uh, Michael Hogan. He's going to talk to you about um, some rookie mistakes that writers make um, by ruining their script in the first act. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. It's about five minutes long. So these are the pertinent videos for this week that I would have you look at um, and see what you think about those and then work on your, your pitch packages. And, uh, you know, if I have anybody who wants to uh, volunteer to do the live pitch in class on Thursday, uh, if you finish your documents by, you know, Thursday before class, um, I think send them to me in an email. Because uh, I don't know, I know I can, I can post a document to this Zoom session uh, for you guys to look at, but I don't know if you can. So if you have something you want to workshop in this section on Thursday, just send it to me as an email attachment and I'll pull it down that way. Okay. Uh, you don't have to volunteer. If you do, there's an extra point of extra credit for you. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, the discussion post will take care of your critique criteria. Okay. You have to give two of your colleagues some feedback, but you don't necessarily have to do it publicly in class. Okay. I don't want to embarrass anybody and I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. So uh, you can give honest feedback in a word doc to one of your classmates very discreetly uh, in the in the discussion process uh, and avoid, you know, uh, speaking publicly if you have an issue with that. Okay. So do whatever is most comfortable for you. Uh, and then we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll feel our way through this. So um, Thursday, then uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more about show structure from the uh, point of view of story arc and character path. Uh, I've got a quick uh, presentation for you and then we'll we'll talk about those pitches. Okay, so that's what I want to do this week. Next week, I want to talk to you about character development. So we're going to take these thematically step by step through the coming weeks uh, and we'll start dissecting this process. So we're going to get you pitching. We're going to get you creating your pitch packages. Uh, so you have a sense of what these stories are in their component form. Then I want to start getting granular. You're going to look at your characters and talk about their character growth and development. Then we're going to talk about the beat sheets, which is how your story goes from one incident to the next, to the next, to the next, through the arc of beginning, middle, and end, reaching climax and resolution. Okay. Then we're going to make your character dossiers, or we're going to workshop your dossiers. Uh, then we're going to talk about the hero's journey briefly. Um, and from the point of view of story arc and, and character arc again, uh, and then we're going to workshop your beat sheets. And then we'll talk about subtext in, in the second half of week four. Okay. The underlying themes that are in your movie that are not laying on the surface uh, for everybody to see at first glance. Right. And then uh, we're going to talk about dialogue in week five and then world building in week six. And then that's going to bring us up to the midterm. Okay. So you can see, I'm trying to do this in stages, right? to help you sort of uh, unpack the whole process of writing uh, a story, a good story for, uh, for TV or broadcast, okay? So that's it, that's what I got for you. Um, any questions or anything at all before we adjourn? Uh, just one question, Ms. Yes, sir. Um, the worksheet assignment, are we turning in just one for all three ideas? Like all three are on one? A worksheet or are we doing one for each work like are we doing a worksheet for each idea by itself this particular document the the, the pitch template i think it's best if you do one for each idea all right the character dossier is you can do multiple characters within the dossier but this one i think is you know some of the information obviously is going to be the same. If you want to just reproduce the page that's asking you specific questions about that idea, you could do that. Okay, just as long as you map out each idea separately, right? So bio and stuff like that, you know, you can either repeat it on the second document, third document, or just repeat the page um, that is specific to story details. Okay, and uh, let's see how that let's see how that works out. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, criticisms, current events? No? Is this going okay for everybody? 
Okay, good. Great. Well then uh, let's adjourn and I'll, I'll see you folks again on, on Thursday. Cool. All right. I'm going to stop my screen share now. And if we have no questions, I'm going to watch the bachelor. Sorry. I hate to take a phone call. I have an important phone. Call. Okay. Uh, I'm going to adjourn. Thanks for coming everybody. I'll talk to you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.